After 14 countries and six months on the road, Spencer Conway is 27,000 kilometers into his attempt to circumnavigate Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near-fatal shooting, rough accommodation, and treacherous roads, but has experienced the diversity of Africa, from its deserts to its savannas and the people who live in this vast continent. He's now in Angola on the west coast and is about to face some of Africa's most difficult countries. He's with fellow traveler Carl. They've recently had an incident at the border. Okay, a lot has happened since the last diary cam and some unfortunate things again. In the border town of Oshikango in Santa Clara, my bag got stolen and I lost the HD camera. So there's no footage from Santa Clara up to where I am now in Luanda outside the Save the Children office. Been here for a couple of days, waiting for new credit cards, waiting for a new camera to arrive, and this is the first diary cam on that camera. Hopefully from here on, from Luanda up to the border with DRC, it's known to be a beautiful area, so we should be able to get some good footage over there. I'm still so disappointed about the fact that I haven't had any footage. I mean, along with, um, along with Swaziland and Ethiopia, uh, Angola is by far my favorite. It's exciting, the people are interesting, and the fact of the matter is they've been through like a 20-year war, and the, the strength of the people and the fact that they remain so friendly and so open to foreigners is just incredible. It's supposed to have more guns than any other country in the world. In 1999, the World Health Organization said that it had, um, the, it was the worst place in the world for a child to grow up. I can't see that, I can't understand that. After leaving Luanda, Spencer intends to travel to a town called Weege and then on to the border crossing with the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC for short. From there, he'll continue to the notorious capital Kinshasa and take the ferry across the infamous River Congo to Brazzaville and enter the Congo Republic. It's roughly 850 kilometers and Spencer hopes it'll take him and Carl three days. So this is the typical sort of view all the way up here. It's just winding roads, very, very, very green. It's about 35 degrees centigrade. So it's pretty hot in the bike gear. Came across this, which is an adder, and it's just got the most amazing colors. Unfortunately, it's dead, but just check out this. There's his eyes, you can see the blue eyes and the wide head. That's the arrow-shaped head. Um, very fat, like a puff adder, but I mean, that's the kind of thing that I want to see alive. Obviously not biting me, but alive. Anyway, I'll put him down on the road and we're gonna, I'm gonna crack on, but that is just an amazing creature. Okay, I'm in a place called Weege to stay the night. Now the thing about Angola, they don't have any campsites, obviously. So you have to stay in a room. And this is a typical sort of room. It's not that clean and it's without water. Now, what you'll find in every single place is these big buckets next to the sinks. The sinks generally don't have any water. The toilets, you get a smaller bucket so that you can uh, blast water through. And there's a typical toilet. It's actually fairly clean compared to most of them. But it seems like Angola, despite the fact that it rains all the time, they don't have water piped through. And there's me filming. So yeah, they're not very classy and it's 60 US dollars for a room. After a $60 bucket of water, Spencer and Carl leave Weege and head for the DRC but progress is slow as the road starts to become increasingly challenging. Okay, one thing I haven't focused on really is the food when you're traveling around Africa. Now, try and get into the local food because it's all part and parcel of the whole traveling experience. An obvious thing to buy is bread because bread is everywhere. And um, a little bit heavy for bikes, but very, very handy. Most countries have some sort of fish in cans, like sardines or tuna, so you can eat those. And then 
obviously local produce. I mean, the avocados you get in Southern Africa are absolutely fantastic. And then obviously there's mangoes, bananas, apples, every, every single fruit you can imagine. So for you to get your healthy kick and more importantly than all of those things, liquids. Always carry water with you because it, it may not seem tiring on a bike, but you're riding in gear like this. It can be very, very hot and you sweat a great deal. So make sure you've always got at least two liters and every village you stop at, get more water. Okay, I'm just going through a really rough patch at the moment. Uh, it's hectic, very tired, sore hands, sore feet. There's only about 25 kilometers to go. But if it carries on like this, it's going to take a couple of hours because it's very slippery. I've let the tires down a little bit and every now and then you get things like this. And if the bike goes in there, well, you're done for, aren't you? That's the road ahead, so let's go see what happens. With the road getting worse and daylight running out, Spencer and Carl are forced to stop and find somewhere to stay. But in this remote part of Angola, they're in for an interesting night. It's absolute chaos here. We've ended up sleeping in the police station. The police have got loads of women there. Uh, they're all completely drunk. It's, it's madness. It's the most African I've ever been in. There were people fighting over helping us. There was a massive fight in the street, full on corruption, full on drunkenness, army driving through crowds of people at 120 kilometers an hour, uh, mosquitoes everywhere, spiders everywhere, snakes everywhere. But yeah, what a crazy place. Right, the town we were in last night where we stayed with the police, the town was called Makela de Zombo, and uh, we're heading to the border town of Banza Soso. So I reckon I'm about 10 kilometers from there right now, and I come across this beautiful, beautiful river, which is obviously in full flow because it's rainy season. Okay, I just came off in the mud, uh, broken off the foot stand, and the pannier is smashed off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take everything off and see if I can fix it. This is the state of the spring that holds the footrest. Now, you might not think it's important, but it has to go back on, because otherwise the footrest will bounce, bounce down and you'll get caught in the mud and I'll come off again. One of the most important things that you can take one of the most important things is tape and cable ties. Because when things break, it's a great temporary way of fixing them. So I got lost uh, on the way to the Congo border, I had to come back 18 kilometers. And now there's a tiny little path near a village where I have to uh, turn off and I'm going to put the helmet camera on because you won't believe this is the main road to the Congo border. This is the toughest day I've faced so far. I've just come off again. Um, went the wrong way. Still got 16 kilometers to the border. But I'm on this path. There's holes and you can't see them. There's my boot under there. But it looks like the Pena survived this time. If you were here, this is what you'd want for television, I tell you, it's, it's ridiculous. This is on the Michelin maps. It's not a road at all. So just having my lunch, after falling off three, four times, don't know. And I'm impressed. No broken legs, no broken arms, just one injury. Uh, isn't that pretty? Not putting me off my lunch, though. After tough roads and getting lost, fuel is becoming an issue. The only way to get petrol in these remote areas is to stop in a village, order a delivery, and wait. But this isn't Spencer's only problem. 
It's the 15th of April, the morning of the 15th of April, about eight o'clock. I'm still waiting for the guy to come with the petrol. I tried to film this morning just outside the village and by pure bad luck, a commander from the police uh, came past and asked us if we were journalists now. I said no, um, but he came to the house we were staying at and told us that we were filming in a military zone. I've heard this story before. OK, we're near the border, but we walked, you know, a kilometre or two, and uh, it looks like they're going to cause some sort of trouble. So the petrol hasn't arrived, so we've decided to leave anyway. Luckily, we left uh, because we were worried about the police and all that sort of business and the army and filming there. But we met the guy with the petrol on the way, and uh, as he came towards us, he said, C'est moi, c'est moi, it's me, it's me. But as usual, these guys don't like being filmed. I don't know what they think it is. OK, I've made a decision, a really harsh decision. I've decided to throw away the panniers. Uh, it's got to one of those situations where it's needed. Uh, they've, they're both broken. I've fallen off about five or six times in the last couple of days. I'm just on this ridiculous track. There's no space on either side. So what I'm going to try and do is whittle it down and I'm going to leave the panniers here for someone. But uh, it's when it comes to a difficult situation like this, you just have to forget about these material things and just try and bring it down to almost nothing. So this is the last footage where you'll ever see those panniers on my motorbike. But that's just the way it goes. OK, au revoir. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Had my uh, phew, eighth accident. Hit the same damn elbow, look at that. So annoying. That's where I fell off. Came over that lump into this and slipped. Through sweaty perseverance and dogged determination, Spencer and Carl finally make it to the border crossing into the Democratic Republic of Congo. Just in DRC, and uh, we're just getting some petrol from these nice guys. Uh, they've got private petrol, so we've had seven litres, probably need another ten. There's loads of kids around, it's unbelievable. I'm, uh, I'm an attraction. Okay, I started riding at nine o'clock, and it's now four o'clock, and I've done 37 kilometres and I really don't think I can carry on. Um, I'm shattered. My arms are not working properly. It's just unbelievable. It's the 15th of April and this is by far the most difficult ride I've had on this trip. Actually, it's the most difficult ride I've had in my life. It's uh, basically it's a motocross track and it was pouring with rain um, and I don't have a motocross bike. I've only got an adventure bike. Once again, I've run out of water. I've had bloody eight litres of it or something and you, you just sweat. It is so humid here. But I'm get, making my way, I'm making my way. I'm getting to Kinshasa. It's 160 k's. I've done brilliant today. I've done about 40. Right, I'm about uh, 60 kilometres, 100, sorry, 140 kilometres from uh, Kinshasa and had to camp here in the night. It's absolutely boiling hot. Look at my hair. It must be about 35, 40 degrees, but it's so humid. I was told there was a good bit of road and then it just became dreadful again. I suppose they've got nothing to compare it to, really but I uh, couldn't face it anymore and it started getting dark, so I just found a space in a field, well, a field in the bush. Right, uh, got off, on, off the dirt road finally and it's only uh, 90 k's to Kinshasa on a perfectly tar road. 
This is something that you have to consider if you're going to go on a trip like this. You are going to have down days. The mantra that I use is nothing is forever. Nothing lasts. So if you're in a situation you don't like, just think, OK, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, but I'm not going to be in this situation. It's going to improve. And take everything day by day. That's the way I look at things. Right, I'm in the DRC, I'm in Kinshasa, and I'm very proud of it. I came through the border called Kisama, which almost nobody knows about. Most people go through the Matadi border, and I decided to risk it and go for the really, really tough roads, and how pleased am I? When I'd made it all the way through, the border guard said that he hadn't seen a European for three years. Kinshasa, they reckon 6.7 million, but uh, an unofficial estimate is that there's 12 million people here. It's dirty, it's grimy, it's hot, it's dusty, but it's a really exciting place. much everyone is trying to make a living on the street and it's constant constant hassle the police are everywhere so you might get a couple of shots of Kinshasa but it's extremely difficult and I can't afford to lose my camera again and I don't really want to go to jail here because it would be a bit grim. Leaving his traveling buddy Carl in Kinshasa Spencer crosses the mighty river Congo to Brazzaville the capital of the Congo Republic where he finds a curious place to pitch his tent it's 6.30 in the morning on the 12th of May, my birthday, and um, I feel completely unrefreshed. I didn't sleep for even five minutes. I started off in my tent, but it was boiling, boiling hot. Must have been over 30 degrees inside the tent. And uh, unfortunately, there was a tiny little hole in my mosquito section, and they seemed to be coming through in single file until there were thousands in there. So then I decided to sleep on the floor, but then when I slept on the floor, there were cockroaches everywhere. So then after that, um, I changed and I slept on the table. And you might find yourself in funny places like this, sleeping on a restaurant table in Brazzaville in the Congo. But that's the great thing about traveling. After an uncomfortable night with unwelcome bedmates, Spencer leaves Brazzaville. His route through Congo will take him west to Dolisi and then north to Mosenjo. From there, he hopes to travel to Dosala, the border crossing into Gabon. It looks like I'm back to DRC type road. I've got 280 kilometers to go, and it looks like I'm gonna do about 30 a day. So it's gonna be a long haul, maybe a week or so, maybe longer. It's very slippery, and I've just come off again. I can't pick the bike up. I'm going to have to work on that one. After finding the strength to pick up his bike, it's not long until this brutal road catches him out again. As you can see from uh, well, my face, it's, it's hot, I'm sweating. This is a really tough section again. Don't know if you can see that. Just a small pothole in the road. Uh, that's uh, one reason for not driving at night. And the bike's just a little bit muddy, eh? So I'm not expecting to make much progress today. I've got to set myself a task of trying to do 30 or 40 kilometers. Uh, the last bit of footage, you saw me fall off, but I was okay, so that's the main thing. Okay, I'm gonna carry on for another half hour. You've got to take breaks all the time, otherwise you lose concentration. <laughs> The road starts to improve, and Spencer makes good progress towards the Gabon border, lifting his spirits. At the moment, I'm absolutely loving this. I'm in the middle of the Congo jungle. <coughs> I only see people every now and then. And what's making it so much better is they're all brilliant, really, really nice people, waving, helping. Um, when I came off, they ran and helped me. They didn't ask for anything. The old cigarette, that's it. So that's absolutely great. The road's getting so much better, so I can make progress now, but I'm not gonna count my chickens because when you do that, it gets really, really bad really quickly. 
but loving it today, loving it. Just hope the bike holds out. I've turned up in a village, Mandingo, and I managed to do 240 kilometers in 10 and a half hours, 11 hours, so it's pretty amazing, and I'm absolutely shattered, but I feel fantastic. And I couldn't bring myself to camp because this room was $5. I mean, it's just, you can see behind, it's just a bed. So, well, that's all really, I'm just shattered, but I feel brilliant. I recommend this to anybody who can afford it or can get the time off or, you know, has really wanted to do it, just, just do it. It's, it's just incredible to be on your own all day riding with your thoughts, with the beautiful scenery. There's nothing to beat it. I could do it for the rest of my life. I'm driving along thinking, hey, this is going well. I'm pretty good at this. This guy comes past me on like a AG200 with like biscuits for wheels. When I went round the corner, he'd stopped and he was waiting for me and uh, he wanted to show me another route because apparently a bridge had collapsed on the route that I was going to take. So it wasn't that cool of him and he took me all on the back routes and uh, we avoided this area. Uh, his name was Philippe, I got a photo of him there. Uh, excellent, that was an excellent little snippet of activity, loved it. OK, I'm about uh, 60 kilometres from the border with Gabon, which is absolutely incredible. I never imagined it. Now, um, the road is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I can't believe it. And I'm sorry, I might have corned beef between my teeth. I do apologise, I just had a little snack. In a day's riding, if you're having a long, long day, you have three sort of uh, different stages. The first stage is when you first start, the first sort of 15, 20 minutes, which I call the warm-up. And you're actually not riding very well. You're riding a bit stiff and, uh, you know, you need to get into it. And then after that, within half an hour, you're starting to get into the rhythm of things. If you've ridden, you'll know what I'm talking about. And the third stage is when you find yourself sort of tightening up on the handlebars and, uh, you know, just losing concentration, hitting things that you wouldn't normally. So just bear in mind those three different stages and try and recognize them. Now, I know you're sick of the helmet, Cameron, but it's only because I'm so enthusiastic about this whole thing. It's absolutely incredible. So far, Spencer Conway has managed to travel through 16 countries in 190 days. His ride through the next 22 countries will take him into the chaos of Nigeria, the tough roads of Guinea, and the harsh winds of Mauritania.